Thanks a lot, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to present this talk. And uh, it's going to be, as I say, the um, uh, limitations of Gamma. Um, gamma was invented actually in Salt Lake City in 1997 at the ICCR meeting in a parking lot. I kind of can't remember which parking lot it was, but it was a parking lot here, and I was describing the problems with dose distribution comparisons, and as you'll see in a second, I asked the question, what if we normalize the axes, and that's how it happened. So what is it? So this is sort of a formal definition of it. It's really the distance between two do dose distributions, and by distance we mean including dose and physical distance. How do we get away with that? I'll just show you in a slide right here. So this is an example of one dimension. I can't draw three dimensions. I'm not that good. I can draw one dimension, right? So I have distance and one axis. You can imagine there are up to three of these axes, and dose is another axis. And I've got little scales, three millimeters here, three percent here. I have two dose distributions, and I'm going to start with the uh, one I call the reference. The red one's the reference, and the blue one's evaluated. They are totally arbitrary labels. The reference one I'm going to concentrate only on the point conveniently located in my axis coordinates center. I just move the coordinates to there. And I'm talking about the relative value of the evaluated one to the reference distribution, or specifically this one point that I'm working on. So as you can see, the a whole process happens a point at a time on the reference distribution. Well, I can't do much with this except I can compare the doses at the same locations. That's called the dose difference. I can also ask the question for the same dose level, how far do I have to go from this reference point to hit the closest point in the evaluator distribution that has that same dose. That's called the do distance to agreement. And if I want to ask the question, do, does the blue line correspond to the red point um, within clinical tolerances, I can say, is the dose difference or the distance agreement within whatever that tolerance is? And that was called the composite analysis, um, uh, which may come up in a few minutes. If I normalize these axes now by the criteria themselves, let's say I have a distance criterion, so sometimes called the distance agreement criterion, the dose difference criterion, all of a sudden I'm unitless. None of the axes have units anymore. And so I can make an arbitrary measurement in an arbitrary direction, and we'll explain why that even means anything, because it doesn't necessarily have to mean anything, and I can just make a measurement that says, okay, how far is that little blue part from that red line? And I can make a measurement. In his case, what, about 1.3 or something. And that's actually called capital gamma, if you just make any one. And if you find the, the smallest, it's called little gamma. So that's all it is. It's the closest point in the renormalized space, i.e., I divide it by the distance to agreement criterion and the dose distance criterion, and I can now actually meaningfully measure something that's not along either one of these axes. And that's all it, that's all it is. So what? It seems kind of, okay, so what, is, what good does it do me? Well, first of all, if it's less than one, that means this yellow line came within this unit circle of the red dot. And if you just talk about pass-fail, you would say it passes. It's within the acceptable tolerance or criteria. If it's not, the answer is it's not. It failed. That's the pass-fail aspect of gamma. Frankly, we already had that in this composite distribution. We'll go into a little bit about, about why it's more important to have a continuous distribution than, a, than a, uh, just a binary distribution. But again, so what? Pass, what does it mean if it's going off in some weird direction that doesn't even exist? Okay, so let's take a look at two um, limiting cases. One is low dose gradient, shallow dose gradient. And a shallow dose gradient, what does that really mean? That means that as I go long distance, the dose isn't changing much. So if I go along distance, the yellow line, which is the, I'm sorry, I turned yellow somehow in this talk, the evaluated distribution isn't changing much. That's a shallow dose gradient. If you just geometrically think what's the closest that the reference point will get, it's logically vertically up along the dose axis because it has to be perpendicular. And if it's a flat line, perpendicular is going to be straight up and down, i.e., it's the same axis as the dose, so it's really measuring the dose difference. That's all that is. The dose difference is the distance between where this yellow line crosses the dose axis and the reference point, normalized by the criterion. Okay, so that's nice. What about steep dose gradients? Steep dose gradients means that the dose changes quickly with distance. That means the line is almost vertical. Can't be vertical, it's infinite dose gradient. We don't have those, right? But it's going to be somewhat vertical. And what would the, where is the closest distance from the evaluated distribution to the reference point if the line is almost vertical? It's almost horizontal. What was horizontal? The distance to agreement. So what gamma does is it automatically switches from the least restrictive criterion, the dose difference or the distance to agreement, 
and ask the question, is it, does it agree with either one or the other? And of course, if the gradient's in the middle, it's somewhere in the middle. So as a tool, it sort of does that part automatically for us. It automatically manages the steep dose gradients and the shallow dose gradients, and that's all that says. Well, you can look at this and realize, that, well, there's actually an angle here that maybe could describe whether an error was a dose error or a distance error. In other words, is it, is it that it's a steep gradient and these distributions were separated by a little distance, or is it a shallow dose gradient and they were separated by a little bit of dose? And you can look at an angle, and so Stock did that. He did develop this concept of gamma angle, and the angle indicates the source of the error, and I don't know, I mean, it's published. I don't know actually if, how often this is used clinically, but you can do it, and this is the gamma distribution for a couple of a uh, head and neck plan with, uh, with some uh, uh, manufactured uh, dose errors. I think it's multi leaf collimator errors. And you see here the gamma greenish is about one, and yellowish is a little more than one. And you see there's sort of green areas here and there. The, this is isodose lines to give you a, a feel that this is the high dose, 95% isodose line. Um, and this tells you what the angle is. So angle of pi over two, 90 degrees, is along the distance axis and angle of zero degrees along the dose axis. You see most of the regions are, are low dose gradient, and so the angle is close to zero. It's a dose difference test. But over here in the steep gradient regions, the edges of the beam where the beams are coming in, uh, any discrepancy here is due to the distance to agreement, i.e. it's a steep gradient and there's a little separation between the two different dose distributions. So that maybe provides some insight as to why a particular error happens. So gamma has, I mean, as we're going to go into, there's a lot of issues with it, but the fact is, it's just a ruler. It can be used well or poorly, right? You can make it pretty, you can make it cute. It's just a ruler, and it can be used right or wrong, right? Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's used wrong, right? It's just a ruler. So the question is, as a ruler, what are its, what are its um, uh, properties, and where can it go wrong, and what goes wrong in real life? Real life here being clinical cases. So first of all, um, gamma, remember, is calculated, remember the red dot? We calculate it for every point in the reference distribution. So reference distribution can be literally be a point. It can be an ion chamber point, TLD point, whatever. Um, it can be three-dimensional, two-dimensional. It can be a, a single point, but it's independently calculated. And the reference and the evaluated distribution can be whatever it is. And so the question comes up, what about spatial resolution? Is that an issue? So here's a, uh, a, a case where we have, instead of just a squiggly line I drew, now we actually draw points because we all well, have voxels, right? So we have to have points in space. And so there are three evaluated doses here, and I just drew a straight line through them to show you what would be interpolated if I interpolated it. And in this case, gamma is the closest of the three. There it is, that's what you measure, and you're like, yeah, that's actually the closest, that makes sense. That's the closest in this case. All I really did here was I shift the dose down a little bit so that I don't have one conveniently next to it. So if I'm just calculating the minimum distance from these three, I get that one. But the reality is we can look at this by eye and say, no, 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 it's really that. And what happens is, is if the space between points is something like the, dis, the, dose, di, the distance argument criterion, i.e. the distance from here to there, right, then you end up with this problem. And you have to interpolate. This was a problem a long time ago. In fact, it still shows up, I think, on occasion. But let's take a look and see what it does do. What does it do if you don't interpolate properly? So I have your two dose distributions. This is a coronal through a six MV square dose distribution. Just look at the edge here, steep gradient at the edge of the field. Now all I've done is I've twisted one a little bit and I compare the two. So if you actually just do the d dose difference calculation, it starts out zero here because they agree perfectly and it gets big here plus and big here minus there. If I compute gamma, it should just smoothly go from zero to one, turns out one is right here, to two. And in fact, if you do it with interpolation, it does. But if you don't interpolate, you get this blobby little pattern. And that's what it looks like. That's what that looks like if you look at it in a continuous distribution. You get, you, you, you get the right answer, then you, sorry. You get the right answer, then you overestimate, then you get the right answer, you don't overestimate, and so you get these little blobs. Okay, so that's one issue. And, and it really, frankly, we developed a paper a long time ago to do extremely efficient and fast calculations which automatically interpolate and that problem basically goes away uh, if you interpolate. Noise on the other hand is a little bit different. So as we start getting towards Monte Carlo doses and we start getting uh, noisier distributions, we're going to have trouble with noise and let's explain why. So the noise has a profound impact on gamma calculations and why. So Graves made this really nice graph to show the story. That's our reference point. 
and that's our evaluated distribution and that's a case where you interpolate, you can see it's interpolating, gamma is exactly one, this is dashed lines gamma, right? If I add noise to the evaluated distribution, I'm basically just shifting the points up and down randomly. On average, since gamma is the minimum, on average you're going to get closer, the minimum is going to get closer on average. So gamma will typically get artificially small as the evaluated distribution gets noisy. If I add noise to the reference, I'm really moving the origin up and down. I'm moving this point down or up. Remember, I'm doing it on an individual point at a time. If it moves down, the blue line gets farther. If it moves up, the blue line gets closer. And so what happens is gamma just becomes about as noisy as the variation in the reference distribution. So it, gamma always gets underestimated if there's noise in the evaluation. It just becomes noisy if there's, if there's noise in the reference distribution. Okay. I, I, this is published again. Look at this. Graves actually looked at this um, to, uh, in the clinical cases. This is a prostate case I'm showing. Looking at what happens if you add noise. This is the reference, adding noise to the reference distribution. The next slide is the evaluated distribution. And these are the average gamma values for these ranges of gammas showing that it basically the average stays constant. It goes up a little bit. In the, remember, this is in the reference distribution. But the passing rate gets a little bit, looks like it's getting a little bit worse. So gamma is getting a little bit larger, passing rates are getting a little bit worse. Um, the um, uh, uh, opposite happens in the evaluated. Remember, gamma gets underestimated if there's noise in the evaluated. And sure enough, that's what happens. I add noise and gamma start to drop as I add noise. Noise is here, gamma, yeah, gamma is here. And then, you know, if the gamma is getting smaller, passing rates get bigger. And so passing rates will get artificially larger, gammas will get artificially smaller with noise. Now that's sort of the structure and the main sort of uh, issues with it as a calculation. What about clinically? So early on we didn't know how to deal with radiation dose distributions. Gamma had sort of been invented and people were trying to figure out how to do all these complicated IMRT things we had to do and we had patient specific, et cetera. And the distributions never agreed all the time. Steep gradients and little shifts. There are errant points. I mean, there'll be a little dot for some weird reason. A diode goes berserk. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, our calculation has a little spike on it. We don't know why. There's little errant points here and there. Tolerances might be too tight. I mean, let's look at it. 2%, that's a pretty tight tolerance. 3% is even a really tight tolerance. Um, noise, we just talked about noise, right? For example, experimental noise from like radiochromic film and maybe uh, Monte Carlo. And unmodeled physics, what do we do? And so if we look at example here, you see this is unmodeled multi-leaf collimeter leakage showing discrepancies in a high resolution film measurement compared to uh, 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 calculations. The calculation doesn't know anything about interleaf or any of that kind of physics. It doesn't know anything about it. So it gets it wrong, the measurement gets it right, and they disagree. And she's like, well, okay, if I'm using gamma, there are points that are more than one. What do I do? You have to do something, right? And so TG119 sort of developed a consensus-based concept that we would use percentage passing as some kind of a metric, because we can't get to 100% with the criteria we were willing to use, as some kind of metric to move forward. Okay? And this is just a quote from them, I won't read it. Um, um, and they actually said that the results could be used as a baseline for comparing by other facilities as they evaluated their IMRT commission. That was a while ago. And this, this paper is still quoted as sort of a benchmark paper claiming that APM was developing these as guidelines. I didn't really think they were guidelines. They were just reporting what was being done in these clinics. So given the gamut almost never passes, doesn't, almost never passes everywhere, we sort of have to have points that fail. But the entire point of using gamma was that it's continuous. So a failure of a gamma of 1.01 .01 and a gamma of 3 are totally different things, right? A failure of gamma of 3 with a 3% 3 millimeter could be a centimeter error. Right? Gamma error of 1.01 .01 still failed, but it's a few microns or millimeters or microns, I guess, right? So, so there's a huge difference. So just saying pass fail is a problem, and actually a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with now is because we've limited ourselves to what's effectively a binary problem, passing and failing. So how well does passing and failing really work? I'll give you the answer, not so well. Right? So Zen looked at passing rates, um, uh, correlated, uh, looked and, and said, uh, do they correlate with clinically relevant errors? No. Right? They compared dose variations to gamma passing rates. Here's a wonderful plot showing the wonderful correlation that doesn't exist. Right? So these are three different detector systems uh, looking at gamma passing rates versus deviations in a particular organ, the contralateral parotid. In this case, I had to grab something. And 
I can't, there's no line to draw. There's no correlation. If you look and say, let's look at whole patient versus organ specific, it's a little bit better. This is again the dose error that you whatever that means, uh, in, in such a plot when you're looking at it with a, such a strong magnifying glass. And they argued, well, look, let's just, com let's just compute the dose and compare a computed predicted dose to the measured dose, and that actually works much better, as you can imagine. You have a, a, an actual dose compared to the predicted dose, and you get, a, of course, as you imagine, a nice strong correlation, and, you know, their argument was this is actually better to do than, than just doing a pass-fail kind of approach. So Park looked at uh, gamma criteria. Um, to look, determine which correlated, if any, well, the difference between, between fluences, one that was logged, one that was planned, and this is all of their criteria. They, they threw out the lower than 10% dose points. We'll talk about that in a little second. And the best correlation they had was 1% 2 millimeters uh, of 0.712. So not very good. That was like the best that they had. More, de more, more evidence. Um, the, uh, the, uh, I can't pronounce this guy's name. Veal Venia? That's a good guess, huh? Um, compared three detectors for dosimetric verific uh, verifications with user input errors, and they, quote, said, no guarantee that pretreatment QA will catch delivery errors even with tight tolerances of 2% 2 millimeters. As a single divisive tool, gamma index criterion is insufficient, and close attention must be paid to discrepancies between calculated and measured dose. Uh, Stasti looked at also discrepancy added IMRT, gamma passing rates. Then he looked at sensitivity and specificity, which is kind of a neat thing to look at, of gamut passing rates and all of these different uh, criteria, and then sort of local and global. Local basically means the percent difference is the local percent difference, and global is the percent difference relative to 100%, the highest dose usually, or close to that. And also found weak correlations using 3%, 3 million, a lot of false negatives, gamma missing real errors. Uh, uh, did argue that local normalization was better than, than not. This is the uh, local calculation method for the three criteria for the uh, a particular organ, the parata, and you see one outlying case way up here, but the rest actually is not that bad a correlation, but it's not great. Um, sensitivity, they found, was good for, you tighten the tolerances, you get better sensitivity. It was also better for local rather than global normalization, which is effectively the same thing as locally tightening the tolerance. Um, the bottom line was um, that they, they argued using the gamma passing rates, really signaling and sort of identifying when you should look at the doses more carefully. Um, and they sort of quoted that this finding, our findings in combination with reported literature indicate the necessity to integrate IMRTQA with a methodology that allows clinicians to predict the impact of delivered doses with DVHs, i.e. anatomically based like we saw with a beautiful correlation of a calculator to a measured, a, 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 sorry, a uh, um, uh, dose distribution that was, that was measured versus calculated. ROC curves, so Bajeko Ford did ROC curves. Very cool idea, right? How well can I predict um, uh, the detectability, the sensitivity, and specificity of a, of a measurement system? And the, at three, so they scaled model units, right? Really nice, right? Just scale the whole darn dose, right? You should be able to see that one would hope if you have a decent measurement system. So at 3%, 3 millimeters, even if you scale by 3%, the ROC curve was pretty bad, really pretty bad. And this, these two lines are plus and minus. 6% um, was better, but 6% with 3% criteria and you're still not catching it all the time is also, one would argue, not so great. Now we talked about low dose threshold. Song looked at, 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 at what happens when you tweak the low, what's low dose threshold mean? It basically means ignore doses below a certain dose. Okay, why? Well, a bunch of reasons. First, sometimes the penumbra and the leakage aren't calculated very well. Sometimes the measurements at very low doses aren't very accurate. Certainly, if you're using local criteria, a 3% of a 10% point is really small, and it's highly unlikely that a measurement system would get that right, et cetera. And so they, all they really showed was that, yes, it actually matters. You change the low dose threshold and the passing rates change. This is a particular example of global normalization, 2%, 2 millimeters, that it mattered. And I think they had, uh, a, a, as you, 
uh, the, the, for when you use global normalization, the percent passing decreased as you increase the low dose threshold, so you have 10%, 15%, 20%, the passing rate decreased. Local normalization, it increased because frankly, you're throwing away a bunch of points for whom 3% is a really relatively teeny number if your dose is 15%. So 3% of 15% is a really small number, so it's not surprising. And they just basically said, be careful when you're selecting your low dose threshold. It's not the greatest you know, advice in the sense, but I mean, it was true that it mattered, and they showed it mattered, and they said basically say, be careful. So if we're not going to use just, I mean, we, we hammered at IMRT passing rates, right? What do we use? You know, they're easy. They're nice, right? 93, 95. They're easy, right? I mean, I have this horribly complicated measurement and calculation analysis, and I got both a number. And is it thumbs up or thumbs down, right? They don't really correlate that well with clinical needs, not such a great combination. What else can we do? Well, so, so Dowling, I happened to find this paper, was using gamma and showed mean gamma values. Okay, kind of an interesting thing, but he was particularly, Dowling was particularly using it for comparing MR-only plans to CT plans, not to evaluate this metric as a metric. Um, Spacey looked at gamma histograms um, and uh, showed that it was efficient in a rapid review of gamma. So now you start to look at the gamma number, the value itself, not just pass-fail percentages, but is it a big number or a small number? And looked at differential and cumulative histograms. So if, for example, this is a cumulative histogram, 97% points, quote, passed, but you now know that at a gamma of two, 99% points had, 1% uh, was the other way, 1% of the points had gamma is greater than two, i.e. 6%, 6 millimeters if you're 3%, 3 millimeters. Um, DeBarton, um, looked, they looked at their clinic, they looked at their data, and they said, we're, we, we can't, there's not just one number, but we have to have something. And so they developed a workflow, and I'll show you in a second, a workflow, they use the following four criteria. The, what's the mean gamma plus one and a half times the standard deviation, which they called gamma delta? How much of the gamma points are passing? How much are we're going to call this less than one and a half, whatever that would, it's not really passed, right? So how many are less than one and a half, and how many are the outliers, worse than two? And they have a series of, and I'll see this is directly off of their workflow, so they're doing some QA, and they're calculating the gamma, and they come down to this step, and they go, okay. Um, the gamma delta, that's the, basically the mean plus of one and a half times the standard deviation, is it less than, are, 90, are, are more than 90.5% pa passing that, or more than 97.2 passing gamma less than one, uh, I'm sorry, gamma delta is less than one and, sorry, 90.5% have less than one, 97 less than one and a half, and only 1.3 are worse than two. And if the answer is yes, go for it. Go treat. If the answer is no, don't give up yet, go check it out. And ask yourself, after you've done other evaluations, maybe look at the dosage, maybe look at the spatial distribution of gammas, are they here, are they there, you look at organ-specific ones, what have you, is it still okay Based on whatever clinical judgment, the answer is yes, you, keep, you go. Otherwise, there's a process by which you try to fix the problem. So the conclusions were kind of interesting. They, they did this really cool job of getting this workflow, and this is literally, as far as I could tell, the only place in their conclusions even mentions it, because they talked a lot about matching their machines and the value of that, which they also did. The results of this investigation, apart from providing operationally defined confidence limits, which I thought was actually a really important part of the paper, but it's kind of buried in these conclusions. I think it understated the value of their work to provide at least an example of one group's operationally, uh, operational approach to saying, what do I do beyond pass-fail? Um, this is an example from stock. I, I, I won't go into it because actually I'm not that bad on time. Um, uh, looking at three criteria, the top 1% of gamma, the mean value, and gamma just greater than one, looking at um, asking, all these three have to, have to pass in order for the plan to pass. So if the top 1% are less than one and a half, you're good. If the mean value is less than a half, you're good. If the, um, f only 5% fail, you're good. And then there's these intermediate steps, again, just like the other one, just go, you know, figure it out, look at other things, and then there's failure. If, if you fail, like most places, you re-optimize, you, you gotta do something, right? There's, maybe they remeasure, but assuming that the measurement's not wrong, you, you know, you, shake the system and hope you get a better plan coming out the end. Maybe you make it simpler or what have you. Now, we don't write the code. We just use the software. So how well does the software work? I mean, 
you get numbers, they're supposed to be quantitative, but we don't write the code, we don't have access to the code. And so um, some, there are some tricks to making it fast and to making it accurate, like the, um, the, the, uh, the um, interpolation we talked about. So assuming the vendors calculate the same way, well, everybody should write the same answers. And so Hussein and others in 2013 actually did that for the following measurement systems. And they looked at, they looked at measurements also, but I thought the most interesting thing was they looked at the calculations of gamma of these systems from a distribution and a calculated distribution and a calculated distribution with perturbations. And they said, do they do, do so they're just both calculated distributions, and they asked the question, did every one of these systems get the same gamma passing rates, et cetera, et cetera? And they used a, do, a global gamma, a global dose difference, and 20% dose threshold. So. And so this is some of the results. So this is a, a, an integral number of the points that had gamma less than one for the six, t t six systems they tested. And you see, actually did pretty well. This is a little, and that's 3% three millimeters for a prostate case. This is interesting, too. This is 2% two, two millimeter test. The independent prediction, so they wrote their own gamma code. Okay, just, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's independent, right? And they computed it, and <clears throat> if their code got 70% passing, that was the spread of the other ones, and it got tighter as you get to 90, 95, 100. But even at 100, uh, one of the codes um, was, our, was still at uh, about 95% passing. So it was interesting that there, even though I can write the equation, you saw it and then there's a bit of a more complicated math procedure to do the automatic interpolation, it's not, I mean, it's all published, right? Even so, different answers for exactly the same dose distributions. It was kind of interesting. Okay. Um, conclusions. So, so just going and throwing up two dose distributions and asking, passing and failing, we know that doesn't work very well. It works better if you do organ-specific evaluations because, you know, you're at least concentrating on a specific small, really it's just a small volume, well-defined volume, and you're not sensitive to the variations that are going on elsewhere. Um, that's really, of course, only possible if you have some kind of composite, whether you're doing composite measurement or you're doing a calculation based on measured data. Um, it's certainly best done in a phantom geometry where you have somehow taken a measurement and cast that measurement onto the patient and then compare that against the patient plan because then you can literally do organ by organ evaluations and you can see, you know what, this gamma is failing utterly horribly in the spinal cord, but the spinal cord dose is five centigrade, two centigrade. So I don't really clinically don't care. Even if it's off by 25%, it doesn't matter clinically. That kind of question can be answered versus I'm at tolerance, I really need to be right, right? Um, it avoids the need to employ what are basically arbitrary and historical gamma passing criteria that are, as we know, through much literature, relatively insensitive to clinically relevant error, errors. My hypothesis is because it's a binary test and because we're looking so closely, i.e. look zooming up to 2 3% variations, 1 2% variations, that the number of points that are crossing this, there's enough noise because of calculation errors, et cetera, et cetera, that we lose the correlation that would otherwise be there. I think if everything's perfect, you'd get a good correlation, but it's not, so we don't. Um, and otherwise, you develop some kind of an histogram-based analysis that takes advantage of this continuous nature of gamma, or the number of breakpoints, like gamma one, one and a half, two, that kind of thing. And so we're ready for the SAMS questions. Y'all ready? You got buttons? Why don't I have a button thing? I'm not gonna get credit for my own talk. Isn't that great? Okay. So, gamma is a replacement for physicists' review of dose distributions. It is a dose distribution comparison tool that enhances the dose difference in steep dose gradient regions, enhances it. Gamma has units of distance. Gamma is a dose distribution comparison tool that is insensitive to the dose differences between the compared distributions. Insensitive. Gamma is a unitless quantity. Do I, I thought I don't have to do anything. I don't. They're doing it. Okay. I really don't have to do anything. Okay. So I'm waiting. There's a timer. There's a timer there. Very good. It's a unitless quantity. It does not have units of anything. Remember, I've divided, well, most of you know that, right? So really, it's just a unitless quantity. Are you doing forward? I'm doing forward. I'll do that one. Okay. Gamma, oh, sorry. There it is. Um, gamma is insensitive to noise. Gamma is without interpolation, insensitive to the spacing between points. Gamma is oversensitive in steep dose gradient regions. 
Gamma can be used to compare calculated versus calculated dose distributions. Gamma can only have values from zero to one. Beautiful. It's, uh, it can be used to compare any two different dose distributions, calculated, calculated, measured, calculated, sorry. Um, gamma values are insensitive to the comparison criteria. Gamma values are proportional to the comparison criteria. This is a really mean question. I really apologize. Gamma <laughs> values, I read that today. I'm like, oh, did I really do this? All right, gamma values are proportional to the square of the comparison criteria. Gamma values are proportional to the comparison criteria if the comparison criteria are commonly modified by a factor. Gamma values are limited to plus or minus one. So I, you know, sorry. I looked at them like, I don't think I did this right. It turns out it is actually number four. If you, and I didn't bring it up, okay? So if you take, and you go from 3% 3 millimeters to 6% 6, 6 millimeters, in other words, you multiply both by two, the gamma values go down by half. That's really what four means, but again, it's like totally opaque. And I think, no, one more, I'm sorry. Um, gamma criteria. They scale the dose difference and spatial axes of the dose distributions. Gamma criteria must be 3% and 3 millimeters. Gamma criteria must not be 3% and 3 millimeters. Gamma criteria can be arbitrarily selected for a specific comparison. Their selection doesn't even influence the results. Gamma criteria are restricted by the RPC, the AAPM, and other bodies. Okay. RP, I don't know what, what is RPC? They don't have, what, what's it called now? What? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I will change that to IRA. I will. That should be a test of the speaker, right? Are they, are they current? Um, correct, 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 correct. Excellent. But yeah. Okay. That's it. We're going to have questions when we're done.